Hey guys, Montel here, and welcome to this edition of Free Thinking with Montel. And I'm really excited about today's show because I got an old friend on who's going to come help us all figure out how we can simplify our lives by decluttering our lives. And, you know, what do I mean? I mean, over the course of the last two years, I know a lot of you, like me, have been stuck at home trying to figure out how to battle this ridiculous scourge of this pandemic and staying inside. We don't realize how much stuff we bring inside with us, and we hold on to stuff. It's really so crazy. Um, you know, you get mail, you get letters, you get things, and the next thing you know, you oh, well, I'll keep that, I'll keep that one, I keep that one. And then you look over in the corner, and you got a pile, you know, twelve inches high of letters that you kept, or mail that you kept, or 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 you know, announcements that you kept that are seven, eight months old that are useless, but they're stuck in a pile, doing nothing but taking up dust. And sometimes, you know, you really have to stop and think to yourself, is it really necessary to have as much junk as we have? I think that's one thing about this pandemic that has helped me a little bit, understanding what's important for those things to have. I mean, we're living in a time when, you know, I will tell you, the whole idea of having those huge houses with all these rooms and all this stuff just sitting around. One day, and I, I'm not trying to be morbid, but, you know, you're not going to be here. And when that happens, somebody else is going to have to go clean up your stuff and get rid of it. And they're going to be agonizing over, I can't get rid of that because I know my dad loved it or I know my wife loved it or my mother loved it. Well, no, they didn't because if they loved it, they would have used it. And nine times out of ten, half the shit that they have in the house, they're not using. You know I mean? I go, I went by a friend of mine a couple weeks back. back who's got a six bedroom home and he and his wife, and now they are empty nesters. Their kids are no longer there. They have five bedrooms worth of furniture, uh, everything from, you know, beds to queen size beds to vanities to you name it. And nobody comes to visit them and stay because of the pandemic. So they're just sitting in this huge house, I think wasting money on heat and electricity that didn't need to be, and they close the doors. That's one thing that was I found so funny. All the doors to all the other rooms are closed, so you don't even go by and look at it. So if you're not looking at it, why do you have it? What is it there for? I mean, I went through this thing with myself, uh, you know, about mm, twelve months ago. I, I, I my wife realized that I had two complete storage units. In Tennessee, where my wife lives, where my wife is from, we live in Florida. These two units were filled with stuff that I had moved about six, seven, eight years ago. Some of the stuff I moved 10 years ago. Hmm. And I realized I haven't even looked at any of this stuff for 10 years. If it was that important to me, I would have at least looked at it. And if it's that important to look at, then I, I imagine I should keep it. But I haven't looked at it, so why am I keeping it? So we literally went through and just downsized. I mean, I, I realized I was spending like a ridiculous amount on the storage units, A. But B, you know, there was stuff in there that could be useful to friends, family, cousins, and those kind of people. So we just kind of gave it all away. And then I went through it, and I finally said, you know, ah, I know what. I'll go to an auction house and let them just get rid of this stuff. Because some of the stuff was pretty cool, not worth throwing out. But. It was stuff worth something. So I figured, let me just sell it all off. And then we'll, we'll you know, take the money and take a little trip or something. I don't know. And, and that helped quite a bit because now I don't have this extra reoccurring bill that I really didn't even know why I had it. It was just there. Why? Because it's just there. My guest today is one of the top cleaning, downsizing, decluttering, and hoarding experts in the country. He is the host of the Emmy-nominated PBS show Legacy List, now in its third season, and was featured uh, a feature cleaning expert on A&E's Hoarders for 12 years. He's identified the psychological roadblocks that most organizational experts routinely miss that prevent us, so many of us, from lightening our material load. He's here today to talk about his new book, Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff, Declutter, Downsize and Move Forward with Your Life. 
Matt Paxton, great to see you again, my friend. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, here. man. Really good to see you, dude. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Thank you for being here. I mean, I kind of was riffing a little bit before you came on, but we're going to get to that in a minute. But first off, how have you been? It's been a long time, man. a few years since we've last spoken. So, you know, how's your family? How's life been treating you? Good, man. I uh, I got seven kids. I've added four more kids since I talked to you. Wow. <laughs> so, um, blended family, but we got... Uh, we got seven kids, six boys under the age of 12. So we got a full house and uh, blessed to still be working, man, helping people get rid of their stuff. Absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting. You know, tell people how you got into this line of work to begin with. Yeah. So when I was 20, I'm 47 now. When I was 24, my dad, my stepdad, and both my grandfathers passed away. So mm. what a lot of us are going through now. Um, it was bad luck. It wasn't like it was an awesome bar fight or anything. It was just bad luck. They all died in one year and I had to clean out their houses. And so I had to go through what a lot of people are going through now, 20 years ago. And I was just cleaning out my grandparents' farm and then my dad's house and then helping my mom clean out her husband's house. And what, what was fast, I remember my grandfather saying to me, if something sucks, do it as a job because people pay you to do it. <laughs> and he was, he was right, man. And here we are, 21 years later, I'm still cleaning people's houses. And it just, I remember I was so lost. I was sad. I was kind of beat down. I was, I didn't really know what to do. There was no book that told you what to do. And I just remember thinking, all right, well, this is what my grandpa was talking about. And what I didn't realize was I really enjoyed all the stories, like all the cool stories from like grandma. So, oh, that was your grandpa's. And, you know, I found a matchbook uh, from a bar that I didn't recognize in my hometown in Richmond, Virginia. And it's called the Tantilla. And I remember I was like, what was this place? She's like, oh, that's where I met your grandfather after the war. She goes, it's right across the street from the train. And so they would like hang out with the guys when they got back from the war. And of course, they probably smoke a cigarette and which they weren't supposed to do. Sure. And, you know, that was she's telling me these memories of the day my grandfather got back from the war. And, but it was her boyfriend at that point. You know, and so like those are the things that now I am 20 years later. Like, that's what I get really excited about is all these amazing stories that are in and attached. To the stuff that we have, but we don't need the stuff. Right. The I mean, if you need the stories, correct. Yeah. You don't need to look at the matchbox to recognize that she kept the matchbox. You know what a matchbox looks like, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just need to know the story. I don't have the story. She has the story. Right. And so many people, you know, again, are tired. I mean, I, I was just talking to them in my little riff there before we started. You know, I mean, I, I literally went through a storage unit of my own where, let me tell you, now there were some valuable to me memories of things, you know, from awards that I received while I was in the military to awards that I received when I was speaking around the country to, you know, little items and little knickknacks, but little knickknacks and little plaques, I don't have enough wall space for half of this yeah. stuff. And I, I literally started thinking, I mean, I'm not going to live in a museum to myself. Yeah. I mean, why would I bother doing that now? You know, of course, I, back when I first received them, they were, you know, phenomenal, you know, landmarks or, or things that, that you know, chronicled something that I did in my life. You know, I received mo multiple meritorious service medals in the military and, you know, I had expeditionary awards and those kinds of things. And, you know, when you read the write up, it sounds so exciting, but that was like 40 years yeah. ago. So what I call those is stepping stones, right? We needed them then to get where we are now. Right. But we don't necessarily need them now. I know I'm a good guy. I don't need a bunch of plaques that says that, right? Yeah. Like, the the my life, the older I get, the smaller my world gets, honestly. I mean, it's basically, I'm at that point where my kids are all teenagers. And so my life is about them right now for the next 15 right. years. You know, right. they don't, they don't want to hear that I'm awesome, that there's a plaque. That's the last thing they want to see, you know. And so I've just learned to kind of just let it go. And I, and I, but I accept what mentally I accept that because you said it right there. These things are important to me. Right. They're not necessarily financially valuable, but they're emotionally valuable. And so I can take a picture of them. I can store that memory. I can tell, you know, not that my wife needs to hear that story again, but I can tell somebody that story. Right. And then I can move on from the item. But I found that, like you said, like I'm paying basically storage on memories to dead people that. I can have those for free anywhere. Right. It's really kind of crazy. Well, look, let's talk a little bit about, yeah. you know, you were on A&E, the show Hoarders, for so many years. Tell me a little bit about the experience working on that show. Yeah, it was as awful as you can imagine, right? I mean, it was a great life experience, but the things I cleaned up were horrific. And um, I loved it. I mean, it was, I like the, 
I didn't want the kind of messy houses. I wanted the messiest house. I wanted to be known for doing the stuff that no one else could do. Mm -hmm. And I got that opportunity and I did it year after year. And I, I mean, the things we saw were unbelievable, but I compare it now to like a, a North Face jacket, right? Like my North Face winter jacket, I could go, you know, to the top of the Alps. I could go to the top of Everest in that thing and stay warm, but I'm not going to. Right. But it's strong enough to go there. And I think my hoarding experience is the strength of Everest. Right. As far as messy. But now I'm just cleaning out your house and your mom's house. Right. Like and so I use all the tools that I learned in the really difficult situations to help mm -hmm. us in the more uh, normalized, just messy houses. I mean, about I don't know, about five years ago, people just kept saying to me, dude, I'm not a hoarder. I just have been in this house for 50 years. And right. I just got a lot of little stuff. And it was like, OK, let's let's normalize this for all of us. Absolutely. I mean, and again, yeah, the show, and he did deal with like the extremes of hoarding, but the extremes bear similar psychological characteristics to the normal hoarder or the normal. Absolutely. 100% the same mental makeup. So a hoarder has just had more bad things happen to them. All right. They've had more bad luck, honestly. Most of them are really good people, super smart, very intelligent, and something bad's happened to them. For my mom, my mom just, my mom was a single mom. I'm using my mom as an example. My mom was a single mom. She worked really hard, three jobs to raise me. And so some things matter a little more to her because she worked really hard to keep them. So my mom would hold on to maybe clothes that didn't fit her or didn't matter anymore because it was every ounce of energy and money she had to obtain it at that moment. And and yeah, and that's that's part of that's part of that psychological problem that people have either because they they remember oh how much it cost yeah. whether they bought it and where their mind was when they did that, but they are no longer where their mind was back then. Yeah. Still holding on to this item, right? My my mom has got every Tupperware thing that she's ever you know the Cool Whip jar with the spaghetti stain thing, right? She's got every <laughs> one of those because we were poor, Monta. We were right. really poor, and we had to save every ounce of food. And the other day, I pulled out my nice glass container to store food in. And she's like, oh, well, someone's fancy. And I'm like, no, Mom, I just, <laughs> I just don't need every single right. you know, good thing I ever carried. You know, But for her, they served her well when she had them, and she's not going to waste money on stuff. Sure, sure. I mean, what else did you learn from people when you were you know, dealing with the extreme to translate to the normal? Well, everybody's got a story, man. And we all mm -hmm. hear, you know, we, in media, we all know that, but man, I heard some amazing stories and that's what kind of started pushing me to really stop and listen. Cause when you're in a horde, it, you know, you're overwhelmed with the volume. I mean, sometimes you take, I mean, I took millions of pounds of literally millions of pounds of trash out of one house and you can forget that this is a normalized good person, right. That has real stories and you need to respect and listen to them. And so it's funny, the, some of the better stories I've heard are from hordes. And not from like regular houses because they just really appreciate the the people behind the stuff. But I'll I'll tell you the most important one is the that we all hold on to something because of the people attached to it. So those every hoarder or every, any grandma or mom in the country, you're gonna go into their house and say, Oh, well, that was my mom's. And I say, Great, tell me about your mom. And mm -hmm. then they tell me this amazing story about this woman that raised them and made them the person they are today. And no matter your house is messy or clean, you love your mom and you love the things she did for you. And that's universal, man, like universal. Yeah, you know, it's very, very interesting when you say because you know, my dad passed recently and, you know, um, he was sick for a couple of months before he passed. So, you know, my family went through the process of cleaning out his place and getting rid of some of the stuff that he had that literally was a, still a value. He had some really nice furniture that some of the, the cousins and grandpa kids and other people got. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, then I, about a week ago, I went up to see my siblings and, my sister gave me these two, mm, they were uh, like valises, uh, this, this folders full of papers that my dad had sent. And on the outside of them, they were both Mark Montel. And I look at it and I pulled out, you know, I sat here and sat on a couch after I got him home. And I sat there and I went through page for page for page for page for page. My dad, you know, for a while there, I guess, he and my mom both, because my mom had done the same thing before she passed. They basically chronicled and kept almost every newspaper article that had come out about me and my show over 17 years, yes. man. So 20 like, years like, ago. Yeah. I, 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 had stacks yes. of, I mean, I look at some of these pictures of myself. I was like, wow, ah! you know, yes. I didn't even want to see myself 20 years ago. And so, you know, I mean, I, I literally went through it all. And at the, I, I didn't, for a second, I felt bad because I'm thinking, you know, damn, this is something that they held on for 20 years for me. 
And then I thought, but I'm not holding on to this for another 20 years. I see it. I saw it. I know what it was. Okay. I remember that article when it first came out. I remember that article when it first came out. The first time I was on the cover of USA Today. I remember that. They had that. Yeah. You know, they had this newspaper, that newspaper. This I was like, you know, so I just put it all together, walked in the kitchen, and dropped it in the kitchen garbage can, and I went, you know, there's no reason to put this on a shelf somewhere to get more dust. So I'm, I love that story. One thing I found is the folder is the hard part to get rid of, not the stuff in it, the thing right. with your dad's handwriting on it. Right, right. right? Well, that, that, I, I, I got to tell you now, it's really funny. There were some papers, there were some, my dad along the way, a couple of times I had asked him to, you know, take a position in a couple of things. I had set up a trust for my kids. So I asked him to be one of the trustees. Yeah. And, and then, you know, after a period of time, when he got a little older, I thought, that's enough. You don't need to do this anymore. I got somebody who can do this. So he, he stepped down 10 years ago, but he still has every single finite legal paper to that trust and everything that you could think would be a legal paper in that trust in this really nice kind of a folder that was, you know, um, a, uh, not, a cardboard folder, but this was a folder that was kind of made of a web kind of uh, cloth material. I thought, wow, you know, he took the time to put it in there and a nice little clip on the outside of it. And, you know, I, I want to send it off to one of my legal representatives to look at. It. And I thought, well, that cloth thing weighs probably about, you know, two pounds. It's going to make this entire FedEx envelope. It's an extra 30 bucks on FedEx. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be 30% more. Yeah. And I thought about it. And, you know, my wife said, you know, we got to just take them out, take the papers out of it, and we'll get rid of that. And I went, no, you know what? I'm going to send it off to somebody else and let them know if I don't need it, do you throw it away? I didn't want to throw away that folder that my dad had. Yeah. That's, I mean, so that's a great example. Both my book and my show are about those memories, right? We got to stop. We got to look at it and be like, okay, before you can toss it, I got to process that memory of my dad. Right. right? And and then you're good to do whatever. And you're like, hey man, pass it on to the next person. I'm good to go. They can throw it away. Right. You it, took it, a minute it, to stop and embrace it and tell that story. And that's the way to get rid of stuff. Yeah, because I didn't I didn't I didn't want to be the one to throw it in the garbage can, but I know when it gets to you know my accountant, he's gonna say, You want this thing back? I'm saying, No, man, get rid of it. Then I'm so not the, the business, one. To throw yeah, it. in the business we call that punting. You give it to someone else <laughs> and let them make the decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did punt. I'm, I'm a punter every now and then. You're tell in a place that you can. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your new show. Now, it's in its third season on PBS, right? Legacy. Yeah, we're third season on PBS. It's called Legacy List with Matt Paxton. And it's basically what we just talked about. Like, I was hoarding was so extreme. And I had so many of these amazing families that I was meeting on, on TV shows. And I was like, hey, man, I just want to know, like, the stories. I don't need to go through this, you know, big nastiness of cleaning. And one day I was this lady's house. It was amazing. We found a 44 star flag mm. and I was still concepting the show. Right. But it was a, sorry, one second. I got a huge train right outside my house. Okay. Sorry. So we were that. concepting the show. I was still cleaning. I was in this lady's house. I found a 44 star flag in a, in a military trunk up in her attic. Wow. And I said, where did you get a 44 star flag? Cause they don't just, there wasn't a flag store back then, you know? Right. And I said, walk me through. She goes, well, I think it was my grandpa's. And this lady was in her late eighties, you know? And I was like, okay. And so I called some historians, called some people. She's like, I don't really know. She was, I'd love to find out. And so I'm just cleaning this lady's house. And we find out her dad, her grandpa was a train conductor the day Utah became a state. Wow. And they made four of them. And he drove all the politicians to Salt Lake the day Utah became a state. And he ripped it off the side of the train and kept it, put it, in, <laughs> put it in a trunk. And it had been in the steamer trunk in her dad's attic and then hers. Right? Wow. This thing was impeccable. Perfect shape, hand woven. I mean, it was actual history, you know? And I remember thinking, like, man, I got to make a show about this. Like, and because I said, like, someone's like, well, what's it worth? I go, I don't care what it's worth. Right. I want to know about her dad. And I want to know about her mom. And I want to know about her grandpa. And so I made that hard right turn. I was like, everyone in TV is going to want to know what this thing is worth. And I was like, I don't care what it's worth. I was like, it's emotionally worth this. And so I really made set out on making a show about what things are emotionally worth, not what they're financially worth. And that was a hard sell. Man. So I got to tell you, that I said, I'm going to make a positive show about aging Americans. And most networks, one network is like, well, are there attractive granddaughters that will fight over the stuff? 
Right. Well, can, 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 can you get some people rolling around in the mud in the front yard? You know what? I said, I'm sure there is, but that's not the show I'm trying to make, right? right. And finally, we, we, we set it on public television. I got to tell you, it's the best place ever landed because they really just let us tell the story. And right. we found that everybody, just like what you went through with your dad, like everybody's going through that right now. And they want to tell their family stories. And so this show is a, it's called Legacy List because the Legacy List is just a, a list of five or six items that tell your family story. And that it's really how your story gets told after you're gone. And so I tell people before you start cleaning, I want you to create that legacy list, that five or six items that matter the most. I mean, think about all your plaques, everything. I mean, I've known you well enough, Fontel, for long. That you know, some people don't even know you went to Annapolis, right? Like it's crazy that the most important stuff in your life, some people don't even know, right? And right. so, how would you pick five items out of your house for a legacy list? It's harder than you think. Sure thing. Absolutely. You know, I, I did keep my uh, my graduation certificate from the academy, um, but right now I don't even have it. It's at my mother-in-law's house. You know what I mean? Yeah. So at, at some point in time, and, and, you know, it's starting to fade a little bit. The color's starting to change on it. I don't think my kids need it. They don't want it. They're not going to put it up, you know? So why bother? I'm going to probably, when I get down there, next time I'll probably go ahead and let it go. I don't you know? mean, you've got that, you've got that asterisk on your stuff that it's your stuff. So sometimes right. stuff owned by you has more value than if it was the same item that wasn't owned by you. Uh, right. Um, that's a, that's an item I would say shouldn't be thrown away. I gotta be honest. I mean, with the history of you going there, like that's a, that's a big deal. Right. right. And there's people that would be moved by that item. And so right. like, I, I mean, that, so people, a lot of military items is a tough thing, right? We get that all the time. What do I do with my military items? Right. With my grandpa's little uniform. Right. right. Well, it's like there's different places you need to go, but sometimes you got to call the institution and say, hey, man, like this was a this guy's a big deal. I'd like to right. see if you guys want it. Right. Now, why why are people I mean, you know, I, I, I guess like, you know, why are people so afraid, though, to let go of their own belongings? What do you think? What makes that? I think I think all of us, you know, our own belongings. It means we were here. It means we succeeded. Right. Like I'll use my own. Item. I have one item that I struggle with my shoes. Right. I have. I have some old Air Jordans that this sounds so petty, right? But I remember when I was a kid, we had to go to, we went to People's Drug, it's now CVS, and they had these fake Jordans, right? And we would sketch a Nike swoosh on these things and color them in in black to make them look like the original Air Jordan ones. Right. Well, <laughs> now I have a pair because I can, right? I finally reached a point in my life where I could spend that kind of money on a pair of shoes. Is it worth it? No, of course it's not. But for me, it makes me feel good. I love wearing them. I feel awesome. I get on stage. I feel good about them. So I keep them. Um, I've run out of space in my little Air Jordan collection. I don't. My, my, my I only have two feet of space in my closet for shoes, <laughs> and I wear a minimalist, so we don't have a whole lot of space. And my wife said, like, "Hey, if you want another pair of Jordans, that's fine, but you're gonna have to get rid of another pair to make space for that." And so I've really struggled. I'm like, I'm not letting go of any of these Jordans. I really like them all. And she said, fine, then you're not getting new ones. You know, and that's really put me in a pretty hard place. And so now I've had to like, I'm kind of like stalling with my little collection because I've run out of space. Right. But what had happened is I got guardrails and my, my wife has really encouraged me. She said, look, you keep whatever you want in that two foot by four foot space. Right. But you ain't going beyond that. <laughs> and and the you little, only got two feet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's teaching. Look, I'm the guy that was on hoarders for 12 seasons, and she's teaching me how to clean. But it's really, really helped because I've learned we don't, you know, we just don't need as much stuff. Right. Well, you know, now you then uh, talk a little bit more about this because, you know, you personally did have to downsize when you moved in with your wife, right? Yeah. So I was writing my book about declutter, just kind of using all my tips from the past. And then halfway through the book, I fell in love with this woman. And she's like, look, I'm in Atlanta. You're not. If you want to be with me, you're coming to Atlanta. So I had to pack up from Richmond, Virginia. I lived in this neighborhood for 30 years, the same, I mean, two different houses, but I raised my children in the same neighborhood that I was raised in. So I had to pack up this house and I had to get rid of about 80% of my stuff. And 80, I'm going to say 80%, which it sounds like a lot. I got to be honest. I really struggled. I was super sad. I didn't. Some of the, I almost didn't do it. Like I remember calling my now wife like one day. I was like, I don't think I can do this. Like some of these things really matter. And I started talking about the um, FOMO, fear of missing out. Right. Mm -hmm. Like so, I was like, well, what about like when my neighbor's daughter gets married? That neighbor's daughter is probably twelve right now, right? But like right. in my mind, I'm like, well, what about when her when she gets married? And what I'm about hold on this for the next yeah. eight, ten years for her? <laughs> yeah. 
And right, that girl doesn't even know my name, by the way, right? I'm just that old guy across the street. But like for me, I was like that fear of missing out. I think that's why a lot of us miss out on parts of life experiences and we we hold on to stuff because we're afraid we're going to miss something. Like your dad held on to those tax records because he wanted to have them in case you lost them, right? He wanted to be the guy that saved it. He's like, here you go, Montel. You me you messed up. Here we are. Here's all the paperwork. And he'd be the hero for a minute, right? And and we want that to be that way for our kids, you know. And I think, and I, but I think people just we hold on to things for that fear of missing out. And I almost didn't move because of it. Wow. I was afraid I was going to miss out on stuff. Now, spoiler alert, I moved. And someone asked me today, they're like, "Well, what'd you do with all that stuff? That you know, what what do you like? Do you miss any of it?" I'm like, "Man, I don't even remember what I was upset about a year later. Like, I cannot tell you. There was an item that I was like, I may not move, and I don't even remember what it was." I, I'm, I'm with you. Look the same. I feel the same way. When I dumped out, emptied out those two storage containers, you know, there's someone was like, oh, "I really want to keep this, but I don't want to have the storage container, the storage in it." And I kept agonizing over it to a point that, you know, I, I'll tell you what, what, what a couple of them were. Um, seriously, do you remember when you came to my studio uh, in Manhattan? I had these big. I, I don't remember who did them for me, but you know, I, I had done a photo shoot one year and. Literally, I think the publicist made these four by five foot pictures of me. Yeah, yeah. And that we hung them all around the studio. Now, when the studio closed down, I packed them up, sent them to the storage unit, and I go walk in the room, and you know, there's these. I mean, there was a really, it was a really good photo shoot, and they were really good pictures. But I'm like, who the hell wants a four <laughs> by five foot picture of me? And me, I don't want a four by five foot picture of me. Yeah. yeah. And it's like when you're healthier and skinnier and you're like, oh, man, like, what? this is just a reminder that I've gotten old. That's you right. Know? Absolutely. And, and, you know, that's that's another point because a couple of those pictures were me like working out. You know, yeah. now, I mean, back then I weighed about 210. Well, I'm weighing 180 right now. I look like, you know, the 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 pre-spinach version of, yeah. of me. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, stop. I don't want to be reminded of that. Shoot, I'll never be that again. Again, stepping stones. We needed them when we had them. Yep. We don't need it now. It helped. It's a useful item. I, I try to tell Peach all the time, like it was what you needed to get where you were the next day. You may yeah. not need it today, and that's okay. Right now, I mean, now there is some good positive usages for storage unit, right? What's the smartest way to use storage? So storage is not. Yeah, storage is not all bad. Like if you are so a lot. What big issue for us is when you got to move mom into senior living, right? And you. How like where you grew up right in Maryland right now, housing market is insane, right? A right. different world of of housing. And so sometimes you need to get everything out of that house before you can you you can't even take the time to sort it and clean it. You just got to get that asset ready and sold. So that's fine. Um, I'm okay with six months of storage too. If you're just not sure what you're where it's gonna go and what you're gonna do, six months is fine, but keep it small, keep it a 10 by 10. Don't do more than a 10 by 10. Anything more than 10 by 10 is a whole room in your house. Right. right. And if it doesn't fit in your house, I got to argue you, you don't need it. You don't, you're obviously not caring about it. But I think storage is good for temporary. And then um, some things are just, you know, like I've seen cars that we're just not ready to do anything with and they're going to be passed down to another generation and cars need to go somewhere inside. Some things just need to be stored inside. Right. So, and that's fine. But I think it more, it just, you got to look at it as a temporary. I prepay for the six months. And say, okay, when that money is done, I gotta go get it. It's out. Right, 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 right. Stop spending. The money. I mean, you honestly, put it on your credit card, dude. You gonna have that bill for three years? I guarantee. You, you know, right. Well, let me just tell you, I had a bill in storage for seven. I'm, I'm, no, I'm telling you, ten years. Yeah, ten years. Don't I, do the math; you'll be disappointed, man. Like, I don't, don't even get a calculator because it'll upset you. Lord, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it was upsetting me when I when I when I really yeah. thought about going in there and finally opening this damn thing up. And you know, it was really funny. I had a I had a safe that I and this I, it, very, it was a very expensive safe yeah. that Dude, I had safes purchased. are expensive. Yeah, uh, yeah, very expensive safe that I had purchased. And if I I kind of rem remembered incorrectly what might have been in that safe, yeah. so that safe just stayed in the storage area. Yeah. And then when I finally cleaned it out. I realized this safe is too heavy to even pick up. Oh, you got to hire someone to move a safe. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. I had to end up, but here's, here's what was crazy about it was that because the people who moved it 
put it in the storage unit. I hadn't even looked at it when it went in there. They put it on its side. You can't do that to expensive safes because it messes up the combination. Yeah. Yeah. So they find that they had to stand it up. And then when I got it stood up, I'm thinking to myself, damn, I'm not sure I'm going to throw this thing away because I think what's inside there, I thought, I thought there were a couple things in there that were very expensive items. So I hired a safe yeah, company correct. to come yeah. out. And the guy went through every machination you can think of. They, they even had this device that they could stick on the front of a safe and it'll electronically yeah. just spin around, spin around until it finally comes up with a combination. Well, it couldn't do it. So you know, I'm like to this dude, man, he goes, I, I don't think you want to destroy the safe because I can rip it open. I'll, I'll, I got yeah. like jaws of life that will bust this thing completely open, but you're going to be out like a lot of money. And I, I'm like, well, how much are you charging me for all of your doors? He says, I'll tell you what, I'll open the safe for you. Look inside it. If you give me the safe once you're done, now, I've got to drill a hole in the top of it to do that. And then I, I because it's a safe company, I know how to patch it up completely. So yeah. it, it's still a valuable safe. I was like, you know what? Go for it, dude. Deal. That's a deal all day long, man. You open it. Let me see what's in it. And you can have the safe because I don't want. I'm not going to take this bag on, you know, 400 pound thing and ship it around anywhere. That's exactly what he ended up doing. You know what? The safe was empty. Yeah. It just had a couple brackets in it, man. I was saying like something fancy from Sharper Image. Oh, you know, like, I mean, like I'm, I'll tell you, I thought it. Well, to be honest with you, I thought it had a couple gold bars. I had these yeah. little, little teeny gold bars that I had gotten as a gift from the Nelson Mandela Foundation. It was they were cougar rams, and I thought that's where they were. And now I can't figure out. Now yeah, where are they? Where are they? What happened yeah. to them? Oh, we find gold in people's houses all the time, man. Gold bars and gold coins and. Um, fascinating things people forget. I found two million dollars in a uh, in an envelope written trash, right? Wow. The envelope was sealed and said trash. And I was like, no, no one seals trash. I was like, open that stuff. It was two million dollars worth of uh, stock certificates that had not been converted. That is absolutely crazy. Two million dollars. Fan the family was like, oh, thanks. Like oh, okay. they didn't really even seem to care. Like it was not that big a deal. I wish they would have said, oh, thanks here, you get 10%. <laughs> Look. People like me and people that work for me, like $2 million is, that's like $10 million. You know, we were, I mean, I'll never make that kind of money. We were like, dude, like what? We're like, and they didn't even blink. They didn't even blink, man. It was crazy. Mm. Yeah. Well, what is upcycling, my friend? So upcycling is really a good way to start. Well, you kind of did it with the safe, honestly, right? Instead of throwing stuff away, you want to use an item for something um, more useful, more modern today. All right, China is a great example, man. We everybody's mom's got a set of China. Um, I got divorced a couple of years ago. The the only thing we both wanted the other person to have was the China set, right? Nobody wanted the China. We're like, no, no, you take it, please, you take it. Mm. We have found it's funny you can't sell China anymore. Nobody wants it because there's just right. it's not useful. It's not really a modern day thing. And so I was like, well, how do I use this China? I found a couple groups that actually will break them up and turn them in to some type of art piece for you. And they'll do like a mosaic or like they'll make it into um, like a statue for you. They'll do something, some other type of art for you. Sure. And that's upside, using something old, repurposing it, and then you can celebrate its life moving forward. And that's wild. That's good. Yeah, it's a good. So it keeps stuff out of the trash. You don't have to throw things away, but it also makes it a little more modern. I've seen people take, um, gosh, I had a guy. I mean, we had a guy that his, it was a family piano. Nobody wanted it anymore. And instead, they they actually busted it up and made shelving for every kid in the family because the piano wasn't that good. It was just the memory of grandpa playing the piano. Right. So they actually had it repurposed into shelving for all eight grandkids. So now That's everybody right. got a piece. There you go. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's very, well, that, I'll go back for a second to yeah. that whole China conversation. Though. You know, I, I, let's I, put in that in perspective. You know, that was our parents' generation, China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, remember when I, got married, I, I didn't want any yeah. China. When I got married, I didn't. First time I got married, I didn't want any China at all because I wouldn't have to lug that crap around and yeah. worry about it breaking. But then I've thought about it now. Now you think about it, for the last thirty years, I mean, it's probably thirty years of, of. There's a generation out there that's all passing away that has this stuff. Everybody that wants because, you know, people they created, you know, paper China. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's it's the dining. The whole dining room is kind of pointless now, right? Like right. It's really. In my house, it was the Lego room, right? My kids played Legos on the dining room right. table. And then it was my office for a while during the beginning of the pandemic. And then when we moved, we did not build a dining room. We actually right. took that space to build an office for my wife and I. I mean, that's just a waste of space because every auction house in the country is filled right now with brown furniture, china, 
in silver. At least the silver you can melt down. Right. But the china, not a whole lot you can do with it. Right. And the dining room furniture, man, it ain't worth what you what your grandparents paid for. That's really crazy. That's insane. Yeah, it just changes. I mean, life's change. And so, like, we talk about all the time, like, the dining room is so important because for that generation, like, think about Monday to Sunday afternoon, man, we would come home from church and we'd sit down and have our family time Correct. at that table, right? So that room was sacred. But that was for that point in time. Now we have those family moments at our beach house or the ski resort or in the car going to sports. Like we have, we still have family moments. We just have them in different places with different things. Right. And we don't, I mean, I don't think there's a family out there in America today that still forces the idea of sitting down together at dinner. Most people are eating on a couch, eating in the middle of the yeah. and, 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 and you banging on the way in their cell phones. Yeah, yeah. It's just a different, yeah, it's just a different life now. And it's not that it, and I tell people, it's like so many of my clients come and say, my kids don't want any of my stuff and they get really angry. And I have to tell them, it's not that they don't want your stuff. They just don't want that stuff. Right. They want something else. Like I tell this story all the time about my grandma. My grandma wanted me so badly to take her China. And I, I don't need China. I didn't want my China. I still don't want hers or her sisters, right? But <laughs> when I was a kid, my grandma was a very young grandma. She was in her 40s when I was growing up. And so my grandma would ride bikes with us, go skiing with us, go hiking with us. And we lived in this awesome neighborhood that had a huge hill at the back. It was called Dead Man's Hill, right? I mean, very mythological. Dead Man. So we thought someone died on it as a kid, right? And I don't <laughs> think like, they did. You know, like I think kid probably skinned his knees. But in our brain, this guy died, right? Slightly. Right. And so we were not, no one was allowed to ride down Dead Man's Hill on your bicycle. Well, we didn't tell my grandma. We were riding around the neighborhood, and my brother and I were speeding up. She thought she had to speed up. So she's speeding up. My brother and I hit our brakes at the top of Dead Man's Hill. She goes flying down the wow. hill. Flying. She got lost. She couldn't find us. Like she got into the next neighborhood. It took her about an hour to find us back at home. She came home furious, like ready to whoop us, like so mad. And when it was time to downsize my grandma, 30 years later, she's like, I want you to China. I said, honestly, I just want your old Huffy, that bike that you rode down that hill. <laughs> and I just wanted the emblem on the front of that Huffy, right? Because right. for me, that was my favorite memory of my grandma. Right. And so I, you know, that was one of my legacy list items, believe it or not, because I just wanted that little emblem. And she just wanted me to have that china so bad. And I said, Grandma, it's not that I don't love you. I love you. I love you more than you can imagine. I just don't need your china to prove it. I need something else. And I mean, and you're never going to eat with it. I mean, that, no, that's God, right. No. You know, it, the china plates were heavy, so you don't want to sit on your lap. Well, and so that's something I tell people if you are going to keep the china, use it every day. Right. Just Put it in a dishwasher. I don't care what happens to it, man. Right. Use it every day. If it's special, every day is special. We all know that. The older we get, if COVID taught us one thing, every day is special. Use your China every day if you're going to keep it. Absolutely. You know, when you think about things like China that are now obsolete, as we create new things and innovation and the technology comes along, I've been thinking about this quite a bit. It's like this whole idea, you know, and then that's in 10 years from now, we will have a fleet of uber kind of organizations that will be self-driving cars yep and once that happens there will be i'm going to tell you we're going to look at the entire face of construction in the world will change there will no longer be garages hooked to cars yep. hooked to houses so that means it won't be the driveway that goes yeah. up to the garage yeah. to the my house kids don't even my kids won't even save for a car because they know you're right they know it's coming right yeah. right they don't even get their licenses you know, they don't I, even want their licenses. It's crazy. You yeah, know? that part's crazy. I, I I I know some people who are also feeling the same way. They're not. Why bother get a license when you can always get an Uber? It's like my what? sixteen year old daughter won't even look at it. Doesn't even could care less. Wow, that's really that's really really. Because then she's like, then I gotta drive the job if you make me get my license. I gotta get a job, <laughs> and I'm like, yes, you do. Right, that's like right. things are different. So this is a great example. The other day, I'm yelling at my kids, get a job, get a job, get a job. Just like you and I hustled from the day we turned twelve. You know. And he's like, no, nah, I'm good. And I'm like, no, you're not. You got to get a job. He's like, Actually, I just flipped all my Pokemons online. And he goes, uh, I got $2,000 I need you to put in a savings account for me. I was like, wait a minute, what did you do? And he goes, all those old Pokemons, I sold them. They're, I got $2,000 for them. So it's not that they're not hustling. They're just hustling differently. And I had, hustling differently. Yeah, that's, that is kind of crazy. And again, it was hard for me to. I'm like, no, man, McDonald's is hiring. Like, that's where I worked. Like, go do it. He's like, and make 15 bucks an hour. Ugh. I'm like, dude, I did it for three. Like, what right. are you talking about 15? But 
I even I've had like I do this with with my clients. I'm like, hey, you got to pivot your your mind on, you know, your brain on this. Like, you, I go, you got to pivot your thinking. Like you're thinking we're old school. We don't want your stuff. But I'm having to do the same thing with my kids. Like they're still working. They just do it differently. Do it differently. Yeah. yeah. Well, what are your 12 tips to jumpstart and decluttering? Let's say, you, you know, you realize you wake up now and it's two years into this pandemic and you look around and every direction you look at it in your place, there's piles of stuff. What do you do? What's your 12? All right. First one, you got to, you got to, I call it pick the finish line. All right. You got to decide where you're going. And this sounds crazy, but like so many people call me, they're like, all right, I'm ready to clean. I want to start now. Great. Where are you moving? Oh, I don't know. Well, how can I tell you what to take if you don't know where you're moving, right? So your finish line might be that you're aging in place. You're going to stay in your home, but you got to move the bedroom downstairs. Great, right? Or your finish line might be you're moving to Florida to be close to the grandkids. Like, I don't care what your finish line is. Just be very clear on it because here's the harder part. You got to put your why and your why is why are you making this move? Why are you making a change? Um, I might tell you, you've been fit the whole time I've known you. Like, in fitness, you got to keep coming because you can quit, right? It's really easy to quit working out. It's really easy to quit dieting. Same thing with decluttering, all right? And the biggest, honestly, the biggest secret of decluttering is just don't quit. Right. You just got to not quit. And so that why keeps you from quitting. And so like for me, like I actually have lost 20 pounds this year since, well, in the last year, because my my oldest son kind of cornered me and he's like, hey, are you going to are you gonna die the same age that your dad did? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, your dad was 52. He goes, dad, you're 47. He goes, I'm 12. He goes, if if you die in five years, I'm not going to be in the college yet. And he goes, Dad, I want you to be here. And I go, oh, I'm not going to die, buddy. I'm good. And he goes, well, he goes, why do you eat all that food that you tell me is bad then? And my boy called me out, right? Wow. And so here's the deal. I want to be a grandpa, right? He told me, he's like, I want you to be there. when I, I said, Dad, you got to teach me how to be a dad. And I was like, I'll do it, right? And so now I put on my wall grandpa, right? Because mm -hmm. that's my finish line. I want to be a grandpa, and that's my why. So I, believe it or not, in decluttering and downsizing, same thing. Is it independence? Is it you want to be with your family? Uh, you know, is it health? Whatever your why is, you got to put it on a piece of paper and you got to put it in your face. You got to look at it every day because you will quit. Like you, it's trust me. And the 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 cleaner the house, the less messy it is, the easier it is to quit because you can just shut the doors. Right. Right. Garage, right. I can shut the doors. I can deal with that next year. It doesn't right. really affect me. Right. So that you want to you want to do and then you want to pick your pick your uh, sorry, you want to pick your finish line and then know your why and then start small. All right. That's mm -hmm. number three. Start small. I cannot stress enough. Most people think, oh, well, I'm going to clean my house this week. It was a three day weekend. We got Monday off. We'll go clean the whole house. And I'm like, how many years did it take you to fill that house up? And when I ask this in a room, it'll be 10, 20, 30, 40 years, sometimes, sometimes 50. Right. I had a lady today, this lady today in Bethesda, near where you grew up. I said, when did you move in? She goes, uh, 73. Wow. All right. She bought that house for $35,000 in 1973 in Bethesda. All right. That's this house, crazy. This house will sell for $2 million like Easily. tomorrow. To, right. I mean, as is, it'll sell tomorrow, right? But I was like, it took you 50 years to fill it. It's going to take more than a long weekend. to Like, it's just going to if you're going to give it the respect. Because you know, right, you're gonna get trapped up in the memories. You get and you, but you need to. My whole point is you got it, and that's the next one. You got to tell the stories, man. You when you go through that house, you got to tell the stories. So if you don't tell those stories, you can't let go of the stuff. And, and you did it with your, you know, with some of the stuff with your dad. You just you just told us those stories, right? And now like some of us are smiling because remember the stories. You got to share the stories. Mm -hmm. And I say you got to pick a legacy list because you before you go through the rest of the house, pick that five or six items because what that does is it sets the foundation of what you want to keep. I mean, I say five or six items. That's it. Share those stories because those are the five or six items that you're going to share. You're going to put out there. You know, one thing like in the dining room is a room that nobody uses anymore. And I've started telling people, get rid of the china out of the china cabinet and start putting your legacy list items in that china cabinet. People are like, what do you mean? I'm like, dude, give every person in the family one shelf, right? They can put their five items there. And then when people are, are walking around, they say, hey, what's this thing? What's this? Thing? Like, oh, that's our family's legacy list chest. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And then you start to tell the stories. Oh, this was my grandpa's cookbook. And this was my dad's hammer. And this was this. And each kid has a different legacy list, right? And so the more you're, one, you're upcycling there. And then two, you're actually getting your family stories told. But it needs to be out. If it's in storage, like you said, how is it a legacy list item? Nobody can even see it, you know? I right. can't share the story if I don't see it. So you want to create that legacy list. And then, and I'm not going to tell all the tips because I want you to actually buy the book too. Gotcha. 
Oh, I got a train coming right here. Hold one second. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I live right downtown and I got no, that's okay. a train that comes only 26 times. Uh, <laughs> Kids love it. Here we go. Here it comes right in front of me. Here. You can hear it? Yeah. yeah. It's cool when the uh, circus train comes, the mm -hmm. uh, Universe Soul Circus comes by. They come, oh. they come every other week. Oh, wow. Dude, it's awesome. <laughs> Everybody comes out and everybody's cheering for him to just go by. That's it's great. really cool. It's really, really cool. All right, I think we're good. Yeah. yeah all right, all right, what was I on? I was on. Uh, you, were, you said I'm not going to give all the tips, but I'll give a couple yeah. more because I wanted to buy a book. Oh. I'll make sure he's gone on the horn. Yeah. Okay. And then another tip. Again, I'm not going to tell all the tips because I want you to buy the book, but. Um, you're going to have to, when you start sorting, you've got to decide, are you going to keep, donate, trash, or sell? And I'm going to really push donate. Like donate, 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 donate. The book goes into great detail of where you can donate, where you can sell items, all things you got to do to sell. Um, the good thing about the book is it's my 20-year career. All my information is in there. And it's got a, a family. I tell a family story from someone I've helped on each chapter. But donation, I promise you, you will never be happy with the amount of money people offer you for what you're trying to sell. Unless you need every penny. And if you need every penny, then there's no question. You got to sell it. It is what it is. But if you don't really need it, there's someone else that probably needs it more than you do. And oftentimes, I'm going to tell you, it's not family members. Family right. members, they already would have, if they wanted it, dude, they would have taken it. I can tell you <laughs> right now. Right. Like, offer it up to family, give them a timeline, right? Say, okay, we're out of here in two weeks. If you want it, come get it. And if you don't, don't say, because they'll say, oh, well, bring it to me. I'd love to have it. Right. And then you're now the delivery person. Right. Don't fall for that. Say, if you want it, come get it by this day. If not, we're donate to the church, veterans group, you know, some kind of group that would use it. Um, I had an old guy, Leroy, that worked for me. He's an old homeless guy. Couldn't read, couldn't write. He was the best worker I ever had. He was amazing. And this lady had an old T-shirt. She goes, oh, it's kind of ratty. I guess we could donate it. And he goes, ma'am, I am homeless. I am not ugly. He goes, I need your good stuff so I can get a job. And I got to tell you, Leroy was right. And I tell that story all the time because, you know, the donation places, they need your best stuff, not your worst stuff. Don't give them trash. Like they're putting people to work, man. Like I cannot stress how many people they're putting to work more than you could ever imagine. So give these people good clothes, good furniture, people that can get the, you know, that dining room furniture you don't want, don't sell it, donate it. Because if somebody that wants to start their house off right, they would love it. Right, you know, right. Well, really, but I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm almost going to be out of time here. What's the name of the book again? Keep the memories, lose the stuff. It's awesome. I promise you, read it. Keep the memories, lose the stuff. Touch everything you need, and then the very back there's a list of a hundred items that the hundred most items people ask me about, from a piano to china all the way down to grandpa's, uh, you know, chemicals in the in the garage. What do I do with it? And it lists a hundred items by alpha order and tells you what to do with them, how to get rid of it. So if people wanted to get more information from you, where would they go? What's the website? Is there a website? Yeah, TV, yeah. So TV show and book, the website is mylegacylist.com. You can watch the first two seasons of Legacy List uh, at mylegacylist.com. Of course, anywhere on public television as well. Um, you can order the book really anywhere. And um, if you want to put your family on the show Legacy List, please go to mylegacylist.com. We are casting currently and we need good families. That's great. Well, what's, what's next for you, Mac? What's, what's coming up next? Whew, I think I'm uh, going to take a nap in March when this is all done. And um, I don't know yet, man. I, I got seven kids. I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I am going to do one episode of Hoarders this summer. They asked me to come back for a, like a super hoard. So that should be interesting. Uh, and then we got season four, Legacy List. And I, I've started taking time off, man. Like one thing the pandemic has taught me, like you don't get time back. And uh, wow. so I don't work in the, in the winter. I take basically I'm done in October and I hang out with my kids until after the holidays. Oh, that's great. I'm going to try to do more of that. I, don't know, I think I got to like take kids to soccer practice and stuff. I think that's what I'll be doing, you know, because they're going to be gone. Like, you know, man, they'll be gone before I know it. And everybody warned me of that. That's and right. It's happening. We got our first college letter the other day and I was like, oh, my God, this is real. Like they're going to be gone soon. So I'm just going to enjoy my wife and enjoy my family and hopefully keep losing weight. That's my goal. Hey, how much have you lost? 
25, 25 pounds. 25. There you go, my friend. That's and just so people know, Montel has been giving me diet tips for a long time. <laughs> God, 10 years. And I finally took them. And I, and I literally I haven't talked to you in years, but every time I eat a smoothie, I think about you. So thank you. Man. Thank you, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you for being a part of the show today, man. I know you're oh, the, the you, man. Been really, really helpful to a lot of people. And, you know, um, love to have you back if you want to give out some more tips. Once Anytime. I'd love it. Anytime we have back, I'd love to come. Absolutely, my friend. Well, look, you take you take care. You stay well, and make sure you tune into the next Free Thinking with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Free Thinking with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please send us your comments.